looked like the whole gang's together. Hiya, Tech. Hiya, boys. Glad to see you. You ready for Leo and me to give you the lowdown on the four-barreled carburetor? Fire away. What you gonna cover first? Well, let's start out with a general picture of the four-barrel carburetors, Wes. The type used on Chrysler and DeSoto is very much like the type used on Plymouth and Dodge. The main difference is in the method of operating the throttle valves in the secondary barrels. A good many mechanics have had years of experience with the single-barrel and two-barrel carburetors, but few have had much experience on this new four-barrel type. Right, Leo, but there isn't too much difference. The four-barrel carburetor is, in effect, two two-barrel carburetors combined in a single assembly. Right on the barrel head, Tech. Actually, you might consider the four-barrel carburetor as practically two carburetors by splitting it down the middle. The half toward the front of the engine would be the primary side, and the half toward the rear, the secondary side. Right, and each side does its share of the job. Gosh, Leo. I hate to think of gas mileage with those four barrels feeding the engine all the time. Ah, but they don't, Paul. You see, only the two barrels in the primary side work all the time, just like a two-barrel carburetor. They're capable of taking care of most driving conditions. The two barrels of the secondary side work at wide open throttle for hard acceleration or for top speed. How do you control the secondary barrel so they'll work when you want them to, Leo? Well, the control is automatic, Paul, and it depends upon speed and load requirements. We'll explain as we go along. Now, uh, as you see, the four-barrel carburetor uses two float assemblies, one for the primary side and one for the secondary side. Each float assembly has its own fuel inlet needle valve and seat. Both floats work in the same bowl, but on opposite sides, huh? No, Wes. A partition in the body divides the area into separate bowls. Incoming fuel travels through a passage in the air horn, which leads to each needle valve. Right. In addition, a connecting passage between the two float bowls above the fuel level balances the air pressure between both bowls. That's right. And in addition, both float bowls are vented through the air horn to the air cleaner and to the atmosphere. Now, suppose we look at this carburetor used on the Chrysler and DeSoto. It's easy to identify because it has a vacuum unit for operating the secondary throttle valves. Now, remember, we said that the basic difference between the two types was in the method of operating the secondary throttle valves. You'll notice, too, that the Plymouth and Dodge carburetor doesn't use the vacuum unit. Instead, it uses a mechanical link between the primary and secondary valves plus a pair of velocity valves, which we'll talk about later. How about running through the story on how that float system works, Leo? Oh, glad to, Paul. As you know, fuel for the engine is drawn from the fuel tank and delivered to the carburetor under pressure by the fuel pump. Fuel enters both float bowls through the separate float valves in the usual manner, Paul. And this fuel is metered through the low speed system for idle and early part throttle operation, right? That's right, Paul, but only through the primary side. Fuel flows down through the metering rod jets into the idle wells in the primary side. Fuel from the secondary float chamber flows into the idle wells through the secondary main metering jets. And you want to remember, there are no metering rods in the secondary float bowl, but there are these two jets Leo mentioned. The fuel then passes into the low-speed jets on both the primary and secondary sides. Here the air bypass passages, economizer, and idle air bleeds break up the liquid fuel and mix it with air as it moves through the passages to the idle ports and idle mixture adjusting screw ports. Actually, the idle ports in the primary barrels are slots. Part of each slot is below the throttle valve and part is above the valve when the valve is closed. In the secondary side, the ports are also slots, but all of each slot is above the throttle valve when it's closed. You want to remember that it's the primary side that has the idle mixture adjusting screws and, of course, a port for each screw. That's right, Tech, but although the secondary side does not have the idle adjusting screws, there are lower idle ports in the barrels below the throttle valves. 
What good are those ports with no adjusting screws? Well, the lower idle ports in the secondary side are for the purpose of controlling the fuel level in the secondary bowl when the secondary valves are closed. The idle adjusting screw ports on the primary side supply fuel for idle speed only, that is, when the throttle valves are closed. As the throttle valves on the primary side are opened, more of each idle port is uncovered and a greater amount of the fuel mixture is allowed to enter. But remember, that's from the primary side only. The secondary throttle valves are not open. Right, and they can't open yet, particularly if the engine is cold. You see, the choke linkage is connected to a lockout arm, which keeps the secondary side throttle valves from opening until the choke is fully open. I see. That means you can't operate on all four barrels with a cold engine. That's it, Paul. And even after the choke is fully open, you won't operate on all four barrels until the engine needs the additional power for hard acceleration or for high-speed operation. What makes the secondary valves open then, Leo? Well, on this model, they're controlled by vacuum. You notice this nozzle? It's in one barrel of the primary side, and there's another in one barrel of the secondary side. As vacuum builds up in the Venturi, it acts on the vacuum unit diaphragm through those nozzles. Movement of the diaphragm arm is what pulls the secondary throttle valves open. So you see, Wes, from the time you leave the idle and low speed range, you operate on the two primary barrels only until you reach wide open throttle position or until additional power is called for. Now, while we're on the subject of what makes the secondary valves open, Let's look at the setup for the Plymouth and Dodge carburetor. You'll notice that there are two sets of what look like throttle valves in the secondary barrels, Paul, but the valves higher up in the barrels are called velocity valves. They are held closed by a counterweight. Now, here's what happens. As the primary throttle valves approach wide open position, the connector link between the primary and secondary throttle shafts causes the secondary throttle valves to open. I get it. When those valves open, airflow acts directly on the velocity valves, forcing them open. And now, if you'll get some fuel mixture flowing through the barrels, you'll understand the high-speed system. Ah, that's as plain as that stubby little nose in your face, Tech. With air rushing through the primary barrels, fuel is drawn out of the main nozzles, mixed with air, and drawn into the engine. When the secondary throttle valves are opened, Additional fuel is drawn from the main nozzles in the secondary barrels. That's how you get the extra power for hard acceleration or high-speed driving. Well, nice going, Paul. It's pretty easy to understand once you spell it out like that. Hold it right there. Before you guys do any more talking, somebody better turn the record over. What's the story on the accelerator pump system, Leo? The accelerator pump system is in the primary side only and supplies an extra discharge of fuel through the pump discharge jets for smooth acceleration. That accelerator pump system on both types of carburetors, Wes, is about the same as the one used on the single and two-barrel carburetors. That's right. What about the automatic choke, Leo? Is it the same for both types of these four-barrel carburetors? Yes, it is, Wes. In fact, it's the same integral type used on past carburetors. Remember, though, it operates only on the primary barrels. Well, now let's cover the adjustments on the four-barrel carburetors. We'll talk about only those adjustments that can be made with the carburetor on the engine, those most frequently made. First, let's talk about float adjustments. Now, as you know, there are two separate float assemblies, one for the primary and one for the secondary side. Right. And there are also two separate adjustments for each float, lateral and vertical. And these adjustments are mighty important. If the level is too low, it'll cause poor top speed performance. If the level is too high, you'll have excessive fuel consumption. And remember, those floats are attached to the air horn. So the adjustment for float setting is made in relation to the air horn. Tech's right. They come out of the carburetor when the air horn is lifted off. So, to make these lateral and vertical adjustments, remove the air horn and turn it upside down. Remove the gasket. You'll have to remove the floats to get that gasket off, then put the floats back on to make the check. Right. Then, with the float arm resting on the seated needle,
place the float level gauge directly under the center of the primary floats. The notched portion of the gauge fits over the edge of the casting. If the adjustment is right, the floats will just touch the gauge. Bend the float arms if you have to change the position of the floats. Right. And remember this, the adjustments are made the same on both primary and secondary floats. The only difference is that two gauges are required. Or two different dimensions are used if gauges are not available. On the primary float, this dimension is one-eighth of an inch. On the secondary float, it's three-sixteenths of an inch. Both measurements are from the center of the float to the air horn. The lateral adjustment is just as important as the vertical adjustment, Leo. If that isn't right, the floats will rub against the sides of the float bowl and may stick either in the opened or closed position. That's a very good point, Tech. The sides of the float must just clear the vertical uprights of the gauge. Bend the float arms, if necessary, to obtain proper clearance. That cover float adjustments, Leo? No, no, there's one more point to check, and that's the float travel from raised to lowered positions. So with the air horn held in the upright position and the floats hanging down, measure the amount of up and down movement of the floats from the closed to the fully open positions. The total movement should be one half inch plus or minus one sixteenth of an inch. Instead of measuring the movement, couldn't you measure the distance from the air horn to the float in its open position? Sure, you could. In that case, the measurement should be one half inch plus the closed position setting. In other words, five eighths of an inch for the primary floats and eleven sixteenths for the secondary floats. Suppose I have to make an adjustment. What do I do? Well, you bend the stop tabs on the float bracket at the needle, Wes. Bending the tabs toward the needle lessens the drop. Bending them away from the needle increases the drop. What about the accelerator pump travel, Leo? The pump travel has to be right to assure smooth acceleration at all speed ranges, Wes. This can be checked and adjusted with the carburetor on the engine. Use a straight edge to check pump arm setting, Wes. Here's how you do it. First, install the connector link in the outer hole of the pump arm, with the ends extending toward the countershaft arm. That's the cold weather position, Wes. It gives the maximum stroke of the pump. Next, turn the idle speed adjusting screw out until the primary throttle valves are completely closed. You want to be sure the fast idle adjusting screw is off the fast idle cam too, Wes. If it isn't, you may be fooled into thinking the throttle valves are closed when they're not. That's a good point, Tech. Okay, I'll watch that. What's next? Well, place a straight edge across the top of the dust cover boss at the pump arm. The flat top of the pump arm should be parallel to the straight edge. If it isn't, bend the throttle connector arm at the lower angle using the bending tool or a pair of pliers. Is this bend made in the same place on the Plymouth and Dodge carburetor? No, it isn't, Wes. The bend in the connector arm is made at the upper angle on the Plymouth and Dodge carburetor. Remember, if you adjust the accelerator pump stroke, you always have to go over the metering rod adjustment because they are related to each other. Okay. Now, uh, how do you make the metering rod adjustments? Well, to make these adjustments, turn out the idle speed adjusting screw to allow the primary throttle valves to close completely. Then, loosen the metering rod arm clamp screw so the arm is free on the shaft. With the metering rods in place, press down on the vacuum meter link until the rod's bottom in the carburetor body casting. And be mighty sure the rod's bottom in the body. Be sure the arm is free on the shaft and that the link and rods are pressed down completely. That's an important point, Tech. Hold the metering rod link down. Then, keeping the lever on the arm in contact with the link, tighten the arm clamp screw. Well, that's all there is to making the metering rod adjustments. Suppose the owner tells me that he isn't getting the high-speed performance he expected from his car. What would that indicate, Leo? Well, if the performance isn't up to standard, it might indicate that the secondary throttle valves were not opening, Wes.
And on Chrysler and DeSoto models, these valves not opening might mean that either the vacuum diaphragm is ruptured or the choke linkage is bent or improperly adjusted, so it doesn't release the lockout ball. Takes right, Wes. So check the linkage first. If none of the connecting linkage is bent or disconnected, replace the diaphragm in the vacuum unit and road test the car. Drive it at speeds high enough to feel the surge of power when the secondary throttle valves open. Well, suppose we had the same condition on a Plymouth or a Dodge, Leo. In that case, Paul, all you'd have to worry about would be the linkage, whether it was bent or disconnected. The Plymouth and Dodge carburetor, you remember, has no vacuum unit. So check the linkage between the primary and secondary throttle valve shafts and the choke linkage connected to the lockout pole. Right. And if the linkage is disconnected or bent, fix it so the secondary throttle valves will operate when they should. What about engine idle setting, Leo? Isn't that a possible cause of poor overall performance? Oh, it certainly is, Paul. So you'd check the idle speed first. Always use a tachometer to set the idle speed. Set it between 475 and 500 RPM. That idle setting is mighty important, Paul. It affects engine performance as well as automatic transmission performance. Yeah, I know. So you set the idle speed first, and then adjust the idle mixture screws for smooth performance, right? Yes, that's right, Paul. But there's a new point you have to know on this model with the vacuum control of the secondary throttle valves. If you have difficulty getting a smooth idle with the mixture adjusting screws, it may be because the secondary throttle valves are not closed tightly. And here's what you do. Check the secondary throttle valve position by pushing the primary shaft inner arm toward the closed position, that is, toward the front of the car. If there's any movement of the secondary shaft, it means the secondary throttle valves are not completely closed. Cut off the engine, then back off the idle speed adjusting screw exactly one half turn. Now hold the secondary throttle valves closed and use the bending tool. Bend the link slightly at the angle to remove all slack between the secondary throttle shaft and the inner arm on the primary shaft. Finish the job by turning the idle speed adjusting screw in the half turn you just backed it off. Then start the engine and recheck the idle speed setting and the mixture setting. Well, I guess that briefly covers the story of the four barrel carburetor. Of course, there are other adjustments and you'll find them in this reference book. Generally, however, if you've got that idle speed and idle mixture setting right and have made your metering rod adjustments correctly, the owner should be pleased with the performance of his car. That's hitting the nail right on the head, Leo. You've done a mighty fine job of showing the boys that making adjustments on these four-barrel carburetors isn't difficult. Like all jobs, it pays to know your stuff. You want to remember that a carburetor is the heart of any engine. A thorough knowledge of its operation and adjustments is a must for any mechanic who wants to do a top-flight job.